So the stickiness gives the customer the next step on how he wants to purchase. Is it online? Is it in the showroom? And it's, it's to the customer's choice. This is the Safari. The Safari is a tour around the consumer, brand, and retailing industry. And we have the great privilege here at my company, Traub, to really be exposed to many of the great minds of the industry who are forming and shaping the future of many different parts of the consumer, brand, and retail world. And I felt it was quite interesting for us to be able to not only learn from all of those people as we do every day, but uh, memorialize it into a podcast, which could then be shared with many of our friends and clients and, and you, obviously, the listener. John Belay is the CEO of Not Standard, which is a men's custom clothing company that originated in Dubai and then came to New York City. The two guys that founded it, John and Matt were literally two finance guys in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, and they realized that all of their friends had very snappy suits, and they had sort of rather boring, I would guess, um, suits they'd bought from the United States to Dubai, and they realized that everyone in Dubai got tailored suits from incredible tailors from all over the world who had all the most wonderful, exquisite fabrics, and they decided to turn it into a little cottage business for their friends, and then their friends came to visit, and they would buy them, uh, or they would buy suits from these guys and then they would reorder through Matt and John and so lo and behold they got into business and today they have 10 stores and uh, tens and dozens of people all over the country uh, working on uh, what is I think one of the most interesting custom businesses in the country and um, you'll learn a lot from him stick around John thank you so much for doing the safari Thrilled to be here it's in the studio. It's pouring with rain uh, outside, and you actually, you know, you took your passport and came above Twenty Fourth Street. I'm uh, I'm checking the weather forecast before making any more commitments <laughs> to uh, to cross Thirty Fourth. Yeah, well, you're looking good. You know, you're wearing. Is this like a, a rainproof uh, blazer you got going on here? You know, on the way in, they they made me check my jacket uh, three times. They asked me. I wanted to get it uh, all the way up in front of you, but we have the uh, the not standard all weather jacket. Got me here in one piece. Uh, so sitting across from you, uh, bone dry here. So t- tell me about the, the, the all weather jacket. Tell me about that. You know, the all weather jacket. Wow. Where do I start? The, the products that we get excited about, um, we can't stop talking about, right? So for me over the last year, it, selfishly, it was, how do we make a pair of pants that you can wear on an airplane? That was a, a two year quest that yielded the travel pants, which we can talk <laughs> about later. And the second was, Hey, we have these beautiful blazers we're wearing. We're wearing great looking suits and you don't always want to commit to a big overcoat specifically if you're not in a warmer region. So we did a partnership with Laura Piana. Uh, we built out uh, something called the all weather jacket mm. and it's gone gangbusters. So you would have seen it first this I November. I have a feeling it's, this podcast is going to cost me a little bit of... It, it, that's the plan. If I, if I can't pay for my, uh, my subway fare back, exactly. we've done something wrong. So John, you and I have known each other for a, a long time. I mean, I was trying to just think back. Um, Marvin was alive, yeah. I think, right? So that was eight years ago, at least, yeah. that where we first it was 2011. Met. And well, why don't you tell a story? You showed up in our office. In fact, it was two offices ago. So I mean, that was like, we were on, yeah. Anyway, so that was a long time ago. And you came in and said what? So I actually went through the story this morning in my own mind uh, for appreciation, had some laughs myself. And I guess telling it uh, for the first time in many years about how the first time we met, one step before that is I spent four years living in Dubai. And what's really unique about those years is Dubai had a real moment in time as the only hub in between London and Hong Kong um, where you could do real commerce and where there was real industry happening and the big brands were there. And for a long time, everyone was stopping in 2006 to 2012 retail CEOs. You guys spent a bunch of time out there. I think Marvin was even there. No, he loved it. And, and in that time, um, we were introduced through, a, I think, a secondary or tertiary contact to um, you know, Marvin Traub Associates as a whole and directly you. And so I remember the first time walking into your office 
we had um, uh, like a small PowerPoint under our hands. It was you and Stan Tucker uh, sitting there. And the we, great Stan Tucker. The great Stan Tucker, a longtime mentor. Um, <laughs> I think it was Matt and myself. And we walked in and we started pitching our idea, you know, uh, rapid fire coming in hot. And you guys are both sitting there looking at us. And I'm like, they either think this is a terrible idea or I think there's something to it. And it was silent for a second. I said, well, you know, you guys are in one of the most kind of a famed retail consultancies here in, in all of New York City where have you been buying custom suits in New York city? And you kind of looked at each other and you're like, well, I, you know, I have a guy that comes to a hotel and I go and I, I see him and stand at a similar answer. And it was like sort of an aha moment. It was like, this is a little bit strange that in that day and age, I guess that was 2011, that with all the retail access and brands that you guys had on your fingertips, we were still going to see a tailor in a hotel getting measured and going through a somewhat antiquated process. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, maybe not the, the genesis of the idea, but that was our, our first meeting. And then I think at that meeting, we were also talking about this uh, rendering that you had created about this notion of a um, negative working, ne negative working capital um, shop within a department store that could effectively have no product yet yield high productivity, right? Exactly. So one of our, our core thesis is going in was, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the direct consumer movement. So before that was even a phrase, we were saying by the very nature of this business, if properly executed, there will be no inventory. There will be nothing to wholesale because everything will be custom. Therefore, if you look at an a famed department store, and so Bloomingdale's was obviously top of mind given uh, not only the fact that Marvin had, had held the helm there for so long, but it was a huge, huge deal in Dubai uh, when that Bloomingdale's opened. We said, wouldn't that be a great way to start with this kiosk? And we had architectural renderings from the firm and we looked at it and said, hey, within 50 square feet, we could do a massive amount of productivity, be no inventory loss, no discounts. And that I think was a hook that had us interested from day one, but I think certainly caught your eye and Marvin's and Stan's as well. Yeah. So we'll talk, we'll come back to department stores and other distribution uh, mechanics later on. So let's go back up uh, to the top of the funnel. You are a business that provides originally only men's suiting and shirting, and then you've expanded to all manner of sportswear and other products uh, to deliver to a man um, a way to really um, create his own look. Uh, and I've often felt that the word or the term or name, not standard, uh, very much put that across, the notion that uh, in this day and age, in the, in the, in the age of eye brand, guys wanting to sort of really curate the way they feel and how they look and how they put themselves out into the world, which is, I think, the case across the whole of the consumer landscape. But in your case, in menswear, allowing the guy to hold the reins, even if on some level you're holding most of the rein, uh, but he feels like he's there with you and he's part of the, uh, the, the steering of the coach, as it were. Um, so... And I think what's fascinating about that, when you, as you play it out, and I know you're, you're sort of working on this, uh, this individualization of each consumer, the, the onesie, as it were, there's the each, your SKUs are humans actually in a way, right? Exactly. And therefore when you have a guy who's a big burly football playing guy, uh, and then you have a young soccer a star who is the opposite of the big football player. Um, and then you have a guy who is, um, uh, from Dumbo and he's kind of a hipster and he's got a whole vibe. He can, they all three can come to you and tailor themselves a look. Um, so how do you, how do you come about that? How do you organize yourself to be able to pivot that whole chamber of not standard to be different for each guy while maintaining obviously the procedures, the processes to actually to have a business? Great question. Uh, so starting at the top, um, as you said, the top of the funnel, what does not standard mean as a brand, even the name? And so the original origin is because no two things will ever be standard and ever be the same and never be two replica SKUs because no two things will ever be standard, not standard as the name took off. And that was basically signifying that you will be unique in your garment. You'll be unique in the way it's made. And ultimately the fit will be uniquely tailored to you. So from kind of point one, that kicked off what was originally a solution-based brand, right? So when you talk about going to an old world tailor, you're not necessarily going there for the brand. You're going there because he or she makes an incredible garment with an incredible fit, right? And that's the solution you're going for. And that's where Not Standard started. 
And because there was no one in this industry at scale, we had essentially our own path to cut in terms of how do you want to grow this business? And what started happening is once you started to represent not only a strong solution, but a nice curation of product, the brand itself started to build a little bit of momentum. And so you're faced with the following challenge. You have three different guys, as you said, coming in and all three of them want, obviously they'll fit differently to fit the three different individuals, but what if they are asking for things that you think more or less are going to be outside the realms of what they should do or outside of a brand, right? Traditional custom would be, we're going to let you do what you want to do and we'll make you anything that you want. And for the first, you know, I'd say two, three years of the business, we, we gave light guidance. We gave light guidance on it because guys, I think were more and more intrigued by the endless customizations um, than there were anything else. But forward push that a, a few years. And what we're seeing now is guys are coming in and they're asking for guidance. They're saying, Hey, I realize the bar has been raised. And because the bar has been raised, I not only want this to fit me, but I'm looking for advice and I want you to help steer me. And so, you know, what we call internally, there's guardrails, right? Or, or bumpers, so to speak. And so we want to help people live in between these rails and find something that's unique to them. Um, and really have that be the last 10% of the garment. So talk to me a little bit about the stickiness, because what I love about your business is that if you get the guy in the door and you get him into a suit, you have all his measurements, you have an understanding of who he is, what he looks like, what his background is, what he might like, what he might not like. So you have the data on him and data is sort of an annoying word, but anyway, uh, that you have the insights. Uh, but you also have the um, ability to sort of say, hey, uh, we now have everything. By the way, I'm going to send you an email with something that's been made up uh, for you for the 4th of July weekend. And maybe it has a special red, white, and blue liner. And he could presumably just push yes, buy or order or whatever the word is. I and mean, it's client telling heaven. I mean, Do you experience that? Or is it really when it gets to the meat of the thing, actually much harder? Great question. So what, what you just referenced is the first step of the bridge from the old world tailor into scaling a business, right? And so the one thing that could never occur back in, you know, let's call it the pre 2000 era was after you got measured from a tailor, you would have to physically go back in They'd have to take your papers off and do all the above. The original origin of this business was all set up so that you could with one phone call, one text message, one click, get the exact same product in the exact same size to your fit in different color, pattern, swatch, et cetera. So that as the secret sauce of the stickiness of the business has been a huge, huge advantage for us. Uh, and what we found to be extra unique is when a guy comes in and we get all of his measurements and he's happy with the product, his probability of buying online is identical to him coming back into the showroom and want to see the full swath of product. Because what you've done, you know, as you start thinking about the experience and then there's, you've shown him, Hey, online, I can show you 80 different options. Maybe I'll show you 40 different options to trim it down. But in the showroom, it's exponentially higher mm -hmm. and he can see things and touch things. So the stickiness gives the customer the next step on how he wants to purchase. Is it online? Is it in the showroom? And it's, it's to the customer's choice. So proud to be able to deliver on the customer preferences there. So we always talk on this podcast and at Traub in general about the power of cross-functional um, organization. And you know what's frustrating for any CEO is typically the one truly cross-functional person in the whole organization is the CEO. But how to then pull through the funnel of an organization that behavior into everyone's minds. What I find also quite interesting about the salesperson uh, in your showrooms is that they're also the designer. So it's truly cross-functional. So presumably you, you kind of have all of the most important elements at play in one human being who's the point of the spear with that customer. How does that sort of come to pass and where are there opportunities that maybe you've sort of seen them uh, being uncovered and where, where other people could learn? Great question. So probably to, to accurately frame that, you have to think about what is it like when you walk into a showroom? Probably an easy place to start. So anyone who's been into a regular store knows that there is a level of inventory. There is a level of product on the floor and there's a base level of aptitude uh, that we expect within a standard retail employee, generally speaking. Walk into a not standard showroom, we'll look at first glance similar to a store. There will be a uh, product on the floor, but less than in a traditional heavy inventory kind of wholesale model. And the big difference is the level of aptitude 
And the dynamic nature of the individual stylus and sales individual is substantially higher than what you would find in any other setting. Because this stylus is well-versed enough to know how to measure, how to gauge fit, how to choose fabrics that fit you, how to think about your lifestyle and suggest other products. So that individual salesperson, we always say is, is more akin to someone that sells high-end software or, you know, financial, um, you know, packages for, for people in, in their family, because you have to know holistically, this is the person's goals, what's important to them, their style all in one. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, how do we think about the person as the designer? The designer is going to be one of three hats they have to wear as they're working with those clients and there's big expectations. We'll be right back. I want to take a second to explain to you why Traub is able to bring you the safari. We pride ourselves in being at the very center of a very global, very complicated consumer and retail landscape. And in our travels, as we help think, manage and expand businesses in many different channels and geographies, we're able to meet and learn from some of the great minds in this industry. And it's really wonderful to be able to bring them to you. And in doing so, I hope that you, the listener, will be able to learn a little bit more about what we do at Traub as well. Back to the safari. So let's talk about the showroom itself. Um, when we were looking at the lease together on that massive showroom, which was petrifying to you now, what is that? Three, four, five years ago? Yeah, three uh, and a half years ago. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was the promise of everything that could come as to how you would communicate with that customer. Uh, the idea that they would, it would be more like a co-working space, which happened to have a tailor in it and a bar. Uh, versus maybe, hey, I'm at my tailor. You come up this incredible elevator, which has, you know, glass looking back onto the shaft of the elevator with graffiti on the walls. And then you open up on the full floor into this incredible space and people do a double take and like, I think I'm on the wrong mm -hmm. floor, right? Exactly. Compared to what they're used to. How has the physical experience from three and a half years ago, which was sort of the a real jump start from what was before. We all remember that, and uh, which was great, but nothing compared to this. Um, how's hospitality and the physical presence and all of that sort of uh, experience are playing into the next stores that you're going to open? As consumers in 2020 get more in tune with the brands and what they're thinking about in terms of how do I want to identify myself all of those factors you just mentioned that people are reading both with their consciousness and subconscious when they enter a store have become exponentially more important. So in 2015, 2016, when we made that bet to take a 6,000 square foot space and you know build out this beautiful showroom, we made a lot of decisions there that were ahead of its time. And we had success out of the gates because the setting was right. It was right for our product. We have a new age brand in a, in a peer set that is largely antiquated and the setting told the story perfectly. Now, as you think about over the last three years, the stakes have consistently gone up across more and more uh, brands. Mm -hmm. You see all these digital native, direct consumer, people opening showrooms and stores. So it becomes table stakes to have this experience. And so what we've had to think about is everything down to what sense in the showroom? What does the lighting look like? What's the furniture? All of those things have to tie out. Not ultra different from the way stores have been doing it for a long time, but in this new kind of swath of brands, it was a new way of thinking and we've, we've kept up with the curve. So talk about sort of where it's come from and to how many stores do you have? How many stores are you thinking about? How, how's it all flowing? Sure. So there's 10 points of sale for not standard spread across nine different cities and you know, when you think of the coast, you've got obviously New York City and to San Francisco and Los Angeles. Those are sort of the bookends of, of you know, where were the You biggest. just opened LA recently. Yeah. Open LA um, in a new space officially uh, early last spring and um, worked out of a temporary space there as we got the market roaring, but it's on La Cienega, beautiful space right in West Hollywood. So all you West Coast people have to go literally immediately because it's there's a waiting list. There's a waiting list. There'll be a line out the door. Uh, there'll be a red rope, all the above. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, and then we have, we have, of course, you know, Houston, Austin, Dallas. We have a big Texas presence, uh, big Chicago presence, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and then Bloomingdale's on 59th Street uh, has been a huge success story circle, for it. Yeah. Full, full circle from that kiosk idea uh, that we presented into to where it is now um, has been a huge success on the men's floor here at 59th. And how are we thinking about the future? You know, the next question is, 
you know, where we see the most amount of opportunity is there is there's obviously a hub that grows in every city that you are, you know, in terms of the referrals, the people that know about you, the advocates and the stickiness of the customer has become more and more powerful as the business has aged, right? So, you know, three years into Chicago now and five years into New York City, the customer base is compounding at a rapid rate because the retention is high. We're seeing customers come in almost faster than we can serve them in some markets. And so what I get excited about is thinking about what are the other two pockets of Los Angeles where uh, we could work with consumers. Yeah. Same with New York City, if I die, Midtown, you have all these different submarkets in the big cities, uh, Chicago out in the suburbs. And that's how we're really getting excited about expansion uh, into the out years. So the, um, the, the, the pace and, and the way things are going, um, I feel that you're, you're, in the case of the company today, you've been around for a number of years. You have uh, quite a few thousands of clients. Um, presumably, they would look to you for things beyond just their suiting. I mean, you become maybe a lifestyle advisor to them on certain things. Have you explored or thought about other ways to partner with brands? Because ultimately the guy's coming to you for style. Therefore, it maybe doesn't have to stop um, with, uh, with, with, with your products that you direct, sell directly. You know, I'll answer that two ways. Uh, the first is, is thinking about how we've attacked it internally, kind of with our own expertise. And we'll take you a little bit back to the, the all weather jacket we were talking about. But um, we got four years ago, a head start on some amazing products from blazers to casual products and into the casualization trend, um, we were way out in front and on product development. And what that's led to for us is you know, we as a business right now have, uh, you know, I think hand on Bible, the single best travel pant that exists uh, in America right now. I think our traveler blazer, which we're going to launch um, you know, in the next month is right on its heels. And these are things so I knew this was going to cost me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, only two forty five. Um, the, but you know, the big opportunity there is, is the innovation that we have internally in this machine that we've built out has allowed us to serve where we saw a hole in the market. So if I wanted to, tr to partner with a travel pant, which was the original idea, there was nowhere to go, right? Same thing on the traveler blazer. So we spent 18 months developing on our development on our own as it comes to partnering with brands, right? Something where we have to think, Hey, look, look, three standard deviations, uh, you know, away from what we do. And will we ever do that? And I use luggage as a great example. Um, we don't have any aspirations to be tackling luggage in the next five years. So therefore, when you look at some of these brands are doing a great job, right? The Ramoas of the world, there's huge opportunities for us uh, to say, hey, we have a great sticky customer base that's loyal, you know, great in terms of the def demographics and where they are in each city. Um, and there's huge partnership opportunities there that we're always exploring. And you've started to, to work with influencers and partnerships outside of product. Uh, you have a, a major league soccer partnership. Talk about that a little bit and how, how it works and how, what, what things to learn from that. Right. So as we think of the, the influencer route, right, which is a, probably a topic for its own podcast, uh, what we're really bullish on is kind of the micro influencers, right? People within their individual networks uh, that have, you know, pull you know, rather than the people that are kind of way up on a pedestal and seemingly are always promoting one product or another. So we found in a more kind of grassroots middle of the roadway, high levels of success working with people in individual communities that have little sub markets of followings, first and foremost. On the major league soccer, uh, where I'm super proud is you think of all the pro sports that exist in the world and the barriers to entry to getting in with them and what that list looks like. Right. So when you think about, you know, the big sport, you think about the Chicago Bulls, right. The list of people that get involved there will be, you know, Dow Chemical, Exxon, uh, you know, Apple, big, big brands. But when you look at at major league soccer, there was a huge opportunity in Atlanta. You had the defending uh, champion team, Atlanta United. And in a transient community of Atlanta, they had become the city's team. So, you know, the, the, the city of Atlanta is built up by people who have moved from, you know, Chicago and Springfield and here and all these different places. And so they grabbed onto Atlanta United only three years, um, only three years old. So our partnership with them was phenomenal because the entire city had sort of adopted this team as their, uh, as, their as, baby, yeah. as their own. And, uh, you know, working with the players and dressing the whole team was a phenomenal thing for us. And, um, you know, we were equally as excited to do it as we were with NYCFC the year before. So a great opportunity for but us. Speaking of random, but really fun partnerships. And for years, I think you were involved with the, uh, I don't know what it's called, but 
guys who motorbike, who wear suits or something like that. Can you talk about, <laughs> I know you're a big a biker yourself, but can you, I've always thought that was the most amazing um, event of all these guys running around wearing suits. Yeah, talk the, about that thing. Yeah, the, I think you're referencing the uh, Distinguished Gentleman's Ride, uh, <laughs> which is like an incredible um, opportunity for raising money for prostate cancer, right? And so we had, um, you know, all of a sudden kind of two, you know, both hobbies and day jobs combined, right? And, you know, I love motorcycles and the thing was, gentlemen, these guys were looking out and saying, Hey, this is what I want to wear on this day. We're going to raise all this money for prostate cancer. So those partnerships for us were, you know, not only meaningful from a philanthropic basis, like just so much fun. Mm. Uh, Cause you talk about the different kind of walks of life you have going through there. Uh, it was a really unbelievable opportunity and something that year over year gains more and more traction and we're excited to support. So I know you've been a student uh, of this industry uh, from your vantage point, um, but you've always been quite academic as well on trying to understand where you fit within it and this whole digital native thing, which as you know from our last reports on the subject, we think it's sort of a term that might need to be put to bed. Um, and with the incumbents sort of learning from how to use data and digital and, and vice versa, the uh, digital natives learning how to be in retail and wholesale and the rest of it. You, you know, everyone's just a brand. What are you? What are your musings on where we sit today, vis-a-vis uh, -vis sort of the pantheon of brands? Forget where they come from, just the pantheon of brands and where the winners uh, will continue winning, and who maybe some other brands that you admire who are um, uh, in other spaces potentially. Sure, and. You know, recently we had a good framework for brands uh, kind of outlined for us at our annual offsite. Uh, so it helps helps put things into uh, different contexts and categories as you think about what type of brand you want to be. Um, so you've got authority brands, solution brands, you've got kind of the cult religion brands, and then you've got the icon brands. And the icon brands were always the big aspiration, right? You've got your Chanel's, your Ralph Lauren's, your uh, Hermes, all the big you know type of brands under the sun. And then with this enormous growth of the digital native brands or direct to consumer kind of choose your tagline. People are trying to determine where they fall within that. And I see not standard uh, with a couple opportunities, right? So we, we started with a, with a heavy kind of solution based brand, right? Like we will give you a better product at a better price, et cetera. And as you look across the opportunities, there's, there's an iconic product brand um, silo as well, right? Like mm -hmm. think about the Ralph Lauren Polo. And as we become more and more well-versed in what guys are asking for and our customer bases are growing, we actually have the opportunity to migrate with some of these travel products and other into, you know, a few core iconic products in addition to opportunities um, to pick up some of the lifestyle brand benefits, which you have around the community. So if you look you know, on a macro level, like what's happening with these digital native brands versus the incumbents, so to speak, everyone is trying to find their niche because you can't be everything to everyone. You have to be really true on what are we delivering to a customer? And we're um, very honest about that and are finding our way through it. And so you, you have um, in any business, you've got to obviously plan and you've got to you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best, but have a good, good idea of how to get there. Um, all things being equal, where do you think you can take this uh, five to 10 years from now? So if you look at the landscape of our, our competitive set, which I think is, is very, very light. I'll tell you why I get really excited about not standard. If you look and, and think who has built a similar brand, I use the word brand capital B, who has built a similar brand in this space and what have been the benefits and sort of attributes of that brand. Um, and what does that look like today? And what do we want to model? I don't see anyone to follow because no one has followed the right path. And so said differently and, and said very humbly, as you look into the landscape, you say, okay, we have a business that has a physical presence, right? In, you know, 10 different locations right now that provides a very curated experience. That's extremely consistent, very dynamic sales team, et cetera. So you have the physical location and you also have a great sales team, right? So check that box. Then when you think about the products and these unique products that we're developing on top of what used to just be commoditized custom suits made by the masses, we have core unique products for our business. They become unique and proprietary to us. So when you combine those two, we're all of a sudden looking at the only business that has not only a dynamic sales force, but physical locations, proprietary products. And you're talking about building something that is extremely unique, 
very cool and for consumers really the first of its kind can you to the extent you're comfortable talk about some metrics because i know a lot of the numbers uh, i'm not going to say them because i don't know what i'm allowed to say or not but you know as it pertains to the average uh, purchase uh, of, a, sure. of a new customer uh, maybe a little bit about how much it costs to get that customer in and then the lifetime value people are fascinated by this and for when i look at your business and given that i know the metrics you know you you're just your lifetime value is eye popping and when people particularly incumbents start to think about their businesses like that i think it's um it's it's really remarkable, and I think in digital native land, you're kind of um, you're kind of kind of the tallest midget. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll run with that analogy there. The um, yeah, so a few metrics. Our customer, so our blazers open at five hundred ninety five dollars, and our suits open at eight hundred forty five dollars. Shirts at one sixty five. So you would assume that the average order value would be somewhere as an average within there. Over time, because of the loyalty in the customer base and because of what everyone has, you know, learned that exists in the customer platform, we have an average order value of around $1,500. So that means that the people who are buying for a long time, right, really know that this is a full solution to their closet, while the people on the front end are just trying us out. And they're saying, hey, I'll start with a, a suit, I'll start with a blazer. And when you mash all those groups together of the new and the old, you're sitting at a very healthy average order value that we're both incredibly proud of, but also humbled by the fact that people are trusting us with, um, you know, a big portion of their discretionary income to take care of their wardrobe. So something we take very seriously. And then you have them. And then we have them. And then we have them. And that's largely um, just because the business, right, once someone is completely sized and right, like it is a product that's unmatchable by any sort of off the rack offering. Um, and then in terms of, of repeat rate, you know, and lifetime value, you know, we kind of joke, I think the Starbucks lifetime value calculation is done off of a, of a 19 year run, right? So they look and they say, we assume that you're going to buy here for 19 years. We haven't been around for 19 years. Um, so halfway there, we're looking at lifetime values over $5,000 for customers, right? And so that over a short time period with the average order value, you can start to see it gets very healthy, not only year one, but in some of the out years. And so those are statistics that we work very, very hard to earn and to continue to provide customers value uh, so that we do that. They're not things um, in any way, shape or form that we take for granted. And so, you know, getting our customers to not only come back and repeat is important, but we also think about what is the frequency of purchase? So if I was for someone, if I was both their shirting option and their blazer option, and then some of their casual product options like travel pants and casual blazers and you know, some of the, the, the polo shirts we're selling, then we're seeing the guy a lot more. So what we're starting to see is, hey, the frequency of purchasing is going up and the average order value is going down because he's visiting more times per year, buying warm, more one-off things. And that to us is a sign that the business is even healthier um, than before. And what are some of the interesting things as we wrap up here that are about to come down the pike? You referenced some product offerings, but any other partnerships or, or stores? So what I'm, what I'm ultra excited about is the month of March for us is going to be the unveiling of you know, our new travel pack. We have, as I mentioned, you know, kind of 18 months uh, behind doors and behind the R&D. We've been kind of baking an incredible, incredible travel pan offering alongside uh, two types of, of traveler blazers, one of which is specifically for the weekends and kind of the after five o'clock. And the other is meant for you can wear it on a plane and then right into a board meeting. So that, because there's no peer comp, I get ultra, ultra excited. Um, and then we have one partnership here that's probably three days away from being ready to announce. So I'll, I'll, I'll stick to my NDA and won't say anything about it, but you'll certainly read about it here uh, in the in the coming time. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll break the story with you all first in a, in a few days. There we go. Good. So I think that, um, you know, as we, we've, we've, we've reached the top of this now, um, as I told you when I, when you walked in here today, I'm wearing my cashmere uh, blazer, which... I love so much it's become my uniform and that I, in fact, I love it so much. I get sad when summer comes because I can't wear it anymore, but it's truly pound for pound, the best suits I've ever had. And I know it wasn't always that way, particularly at the beginning. And, um, it's remarkable to see how far you've come. I know it hasn't been easy at times and it's been really joyous at others. And I, it's wonderful to see you guys continue to, to crush it. And, um, Appreciate that. thank you so much for coming to join us on this rainy day and do the safari. Thanks for having me on Morty. If you want to learn a little bit more about Traub, you can go to traub.io. 
where you'll learn a lot about everything that we do. If you're enjoying the safari, please do share it with your friends and colleagues within the industry. And please also don't forget to subscribe and like it. Until next time.